It's so I'll start. My name is uh, Alexander Boyd, and I've been a stonemason for coming on 16 years now. So eight of those years will be in Canada. And before that, was uh, trained in the UK at Wells Cathedral Stonemasons, which they were a originally the masonry company that worked on Wells Cathedral, which is actually the smallest city in England. So a very ornate cathedral covered in carvings and did my apprenticeship there three years and then went on to do additional training uh, part of a competition series called skill build and then eventually world skills which is international trade competition so it, it covers everything from massage to masonry to uh, refrigeration fixing it's pretty wide thing so yeah i came to canada 2013 I've been at Wells for seven years at that point, and uh, I was looking to see something new in the world. And uh, I've been traveling around for a couple of years. I've kind of moonlight as a professional BMXer on the side, so I've been doing that for 20 years and uh, was lucky enough to travel a lot with that. So moving with my job kind of felt like the next natural step. And they were advertising for Masons on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. So. Yeah, they pretty much they bit my hand off and I ended up moving out there at the age of 23 and worked with that company, which is RJW Stonemasons. Uh, ever since then, really, I've been traveling around working on projects in, in Ontario and worked on the legislative building in Saskatchewan, Regina, and of course, Calgary City Hall, which is where I met Dave uh, for the past four years. Awesome. Now, uh... So your first job in Canada was on Parliament Hill, hey? That's correct, yeah. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it so was a monster, a monster of a project. Yeah, and okay, what were you doing, the, what were you, what were you doing with the, the Parliament buildings? So my duties on uh, West Block, the West Block project, I was part of what we would call the Dutchman crew, which uh, a Dutchman repair is uh, kind of like a little jigsaw puzzle for stone. So you would remove the broken piece of stone and you'd make a new piece to fit and then you'd pin it to the new piece, the old piece of stone. And the idea is that it's a, kind of a seamless joint that we aim to have a one millimeter or less joint so that there's a nice smooth transition from the new piece that you fixed into the old piece. Um, and after a couple of years, you know, the new piece weathers in and you can hardly tell there's a repair. Yeah, hopefully it all goes well. But, so I was, uh, was in the Dutchman crew doing a lot of repairs uh, all over the building, all the towers, all levels. Uh, there was quite a few um, guys from Europe that came over on that. I think it was probably about 10 people in total uh, on the crew. Um, a couple of Canadians, um, a few that went to the UK to train, a couple that had received training at Algonquin College. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Algonquin program. Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. But um, the majority of the Canadian Masons had their training there. Uh, yeah, that, that was pretty much it. What I did on West Park, it was the Dutchman crew and uh, also cutting stone. So my, to give you some context on that, my actual job title would be a banker mason. So uh, a banker mason is responsible for cutting architectural elements of a building. So it could be window sills, it could be lintels, it could be uh, ornate tracery windows, uh, all aspects of architectural uh, building that would be the stuff I make out of stone. Fantastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sweet, that's a... Um... So a uh, common misconception, especially I found in Canada, I can't speak the whole of North America, but uh, stonemasons uh, is thrown around quite a lot, uh, fairly flippantly, I find. But there's actually uh, different facets to stonemasonry as a whole. So there's the building aspect, installing of the stones that I make. There is the, the bank of masonry, which is what, what, what I do, the, the cutting and carving of architectural elements. And there's also the carving and sculptural side of things, which is, um, it gets a bit confusing, but yeah, uh, ornamental architectural elements, which would be a separate kind of thing. So that's when you think of like gargoyles, grotesques, things like that, these young buildings, um, architectural carvers would be doing that. So it's actually separate to what I do. I do kind of geometry, straight lines, would be a simple way to put it and the carvers do kind of artsy fartsy stuff if you want to put it that way so yeah i didn't know this actually getting into the trade so i actually wanted to be a sculptor and a carver 
I ended up becoming a banker mason uh, just because that's what they did at Wells. So, uh, something today I still enjoy doing is a, is a bit of the, the uh, artsy fartsy stuff on the side. Yeah, that's quite funny. Um... I feel as though there's been a large decline in uh, architectural cut stone um, in the residential realm and actually also in the commercial realm, um, reflecting on most of the work I do has been on existing heritage buildings uh, as opposed to creating new ones. I'm not saying that everyone should be you know, creating cathedrals and churches, which would be really cool, but um, definitely see a lack of, uh, of architectural cut stone elements in, in newer buildings, um, whether that's due to you know, just modern materials being used and stone being an inferior material, I couldn't tell you that, but I definitely see a, a lack of that being being used today. So going forward, you know, hopefully we, we continue to restore our heritage buildings, otherwise we're going to lose that completely. That would be a concern of mine. It's, uh, I actually don't think that much knowledge is being lost, which is great, to be fair, like uh, my apprenticeship. So I can't really speak for, for Canadian education, not something that really exists currently, which is something I'd actually like to change. But um, I'm taught everything traditionally, and most people are, and even the folks that, that are taught here, they're, they're taught traditional techniques with hand tools primarily first, and then moving on to pneumatic tools and, and power tools after that. So um, yeah, I'm happy to say that you know we're taught everything. We're taught the geometry side of things. We're taught a little bit of carving and sculpture. We're taught tool maintenance. We're taught all about the stone, how it cuts, the bedding, even even down to how to split it at the quarry. Like we're taught that too. So yeah, it's good. It's a good good foundation that you're given when you're, when you're taught this stuff. Uh, in terms of is anything being kind of lost? Um, Definitely in a commercial setting that you know, there's a tendency to lean towards the power tools side of things. You know, uh, the project I'm on right now, I get to use my mallet because there's a uh, tooling. So like a tooling is kind of like a batting. Uh, it's like little divots in the stone, basically. So I'm able to use my mallet. It's getting more use than it has in years just, just because of that. And usually we just use grinders and, and pneumatic tools. So, you know, in a commercial setting, that could be the, the situation where you'd lose some of those, those hand, hand skills over the years, just because it's because of production is the, is the end result, really. So I'm going to jump in for a sec, Alex, just to clarify. Um, it sounds like modern machines um, are going to pose a threat to traditional craft techniques, and that would be the use of um, like CNC carving, for instance, or CNC Absolutely. cutting. Yeah, good point, Dave. Yeah, so they're, they're definitely coming more and more into fashion. Uh, I think I heard that Carleton University has, uh, has their, even has their own CNC set up now with a six-axis machine or whatever it's called there. But there, there's definitely machinery out there, especially produced in Italy, which is a hub for, for masonry. They're at the forefront of making these like laser machines and these six axis robot arms that can pretty much do our jobs. Yeah. But that being said, I don't think that it's going to be for a long time where you're going to have guys on site that are going to be replaced by these machines. There's going to be, there's always going to be a need for that, for that human kind of skill on site on the scaffold to do these repairs, like, such as the Dutchman repairs. Like I'm not sure how you'd automate that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good explanation. So I would again uh, kind of double down on the, the hand tools side of things. Um, to me, it just gives a solid foundation of the entire trade without working stone by hand. You never really get a true feel for how the stone reacts, which I think is just like core fundamental part of the trade. Like you need to know how the stone reacts to a certain angle or the way you hit it or what you hit it with or what chisel you use. You need to understand that before you move on to using pneumatic tools or, or, or saws or power tools like that. So 
yeah, definitely hand tools for that one. For sure. Make it hard. Yeah. Um, well, actually, can I just touch on a couple more points there? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'd say the use uh, to moving away from sort of what I primarily do, but um, to raise awareness more about line-based mortars and less about Portland and Cementius-based mortars just for the longevity of the buildings going forward. You can see, uh, you see quite a few cowboy jobs done with uh, kind of lack of knowledge when, in terms of mortar and it it's really detrimental to the building and then ends up having to be fixed in you know, five, 10 years down the line anyway. So um, more, more knowledge and information needs to be spread about, about that. And that's, that's, also, that's, that's, that's traditional material, Alex, you're, you're talking about. So, so shifting away from modern material and using the more traditional materials as well. Exactly. As traditional yeah. craft. Yeah. Because the line based mortars would be more uh, traditional or, or historically accurate. Yes. And maybe offer better performance than the cement based. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. And uh, also the just general knowledge about uh, precast stone as a, as a material. Uh, natural stone will outlast precast stone by a, by a country mile. And unfortunately, you know, it tends to be a slightly cheaper and more readily available material. So the general public will go towards precast stone. But I think there's maybe a, a common misconception there with they should be using it or not for longevity anyway it's going to fail way quicker way way quicker so, yeah that's all i had to say about that one sorry oh no worries um so sorry could you uh, repeat the question about the yeah uh, sure um important the single skill. most most important skill or knowledge to execute your trade but if, if that we don't need to dig in deep but I, I think that's interesting the, the natural material sorry i was just trying to Write it down on the side of you saying that natural yeah, stone yeah, sorry, back, lasts yeah. longer, right? Is what you're saying? Yeah, well, than the I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Especially in the climates that we have in Canada, the precast material. Uh, as soon as any moisture gets in there, it's going to fail. Whereas stone can receive moisture and it can breathe and it can get rid of it too. It's kind of more breathable material. Yeah, you answered my next question too. I was going to ask why why the uh, why the natural stones last longer than the precast. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be repaired too. Like a, you can patch a, or you know, do a Dutch and repair on a natural piece of stone, and say it could it could last you know two hundred plus years if, if if so. And there's no way that precast material is going to last that long. There's no way. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. No intervention. I guess there would be no intervention for a precast material other than to replace it again. But, um, so yeah. So most important skill. Um, yeah, it was a tough one to think about. Really. Uh, I think I'm just going to say patience, to be honest. I mean, to be to be beaten on a piece of stone for sometimes days at a time, like, wasn't really something I was expecting when I came into the trade. It's like, yeah, it kind of gets you off guard at first, but some stones can take weeks. And I think without that patience, you're not going to have a good time. You're really not going to have a good time. You can't come into the trade expecting that you're going to be making, finishing something the same day or, these things take time. Yeah, definitely take time. Yeah, it's definitely been a theme of uh, all the people that we've talked to so far. I've talked about, uh, for example, the gentleman this morning was uh, his word that he used was um, caring for it. And it... we got time. All right, we got time. All right, all right. It's so dangerous. Um, so I was, uh, I'll, I'll give you my mini story, I suppose, then. All right. Uh, I was actually terrible at masonry for the first two years. I was, I was awful. I had like zero hand-eye coordination. I was blowing corners off left, right, and center. And none of the guys wanted to teach me at Wells. They, uh, I was this chubby little 16 year old kid and probably had a bit of an attitude on me. And uh, no one really took a shine to me. So for the first two years, yeah, it was pretty painful for me, but uh, I found college fairly, fairly easy. Um, I didn't really pay attention in school much, but when I came to college, I was like it was fairly practical and I found that I enjoyed that. So I found that I excelled and everything just fell into place in the, in the third year and, uh, just got really good. Like, uh, just, and everyone was kind of shocked. They thought I was a lost hope. So I got taught by everyone, which is really cool because 
everyone suddenly took a shine to me and they started teaching me their, their little hints and tips and stuff. And there was probably about 12 different masons there. In a typical situation, you'd have like an apprentice master who would be the guy who's teaching you. But my, my situation was unique where I, I got some from everyone. So served me quite well, served me good. So I, in college side of things, I was taught by a chap called Malcolm, I was a raging alcoholic, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, there was Richard, um, Richard Hoyle, Craig Murphy, and Darren Tilby. Malcolm Morris was his name, actually, Malcolm Morris. And they're fantastic guys, great masons, wonderful teachers, very respectful, um, intelligent guys, great sense of humor. And uh, it was a new program, so I went to Moulton College in Northamptonshire which is a agriculture, horticulture college and a construction college now. So there was three separate programs in the UK at the time. Uh, there was one at Weymouth, there was one at Bath and there was one at York. And they were kind of like the three strongholds for, for masonry education in the UK. Uh, I don't know if you're surprised to hear this or not, but yeah, there's only, there's only like four, maybe four now. So, um, my class size was about 25 guys in the first year and by the third year it was four. So yeah, a lot of people gave up in that, in that the, those first two years for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, no, it was a great education. I, I applied myself and, and did well. And through that time, um, I, they selected me to go through these competitions, which I, I touched on earlier. So. Uh, skill build was the first set of competitions, which is uh, starts off at a regional level. So it's for people who are under 21 are excelling at their trade. So my college picked me out and I did some preliminary tests and did well and they sent me off for this thing. So did did alright, got silver and I got silver in another competition, a one day competition in London and then went on to the national one. Uh, I got another silver as a theme here. Uh, second place <laughs> and uh, yeah eventually after that um, I got selected to train for the world skills competition which is the other one I was talking about there uh, under the mentorship of Kevin Calpin and Kevin is a very renowned stonemason in the north of the UK again fantastic man uh, very knowledgeable very intelligent um, he had additional training for an extra two years which I spent traveling around the country doing seminars and team building exercises and training with some of the best guys in the UK. So I spent a bit of time at York Minster uh, under the carving supervision of Jeff Butler, who was the head carver there at the time. It was really interesting. Um, did some sculptural work with Piers Merry, who's a accomplished carver in the north of the UK. Um, and lots of banker masonry training with Kevin and I trained with two other friends of mine, uh, Tom and Chris. And uh, Chris actually went on to win gold for the UK at World Skills. So pretty awesome, pretty awesome stuff. And Tom came over to Canada and that's how I heard about the West Block project. It was Tom kind of set me up with that one. So yeah, so it's uh, three years of a, a traditional apprenticeship and then followed by basically another three years of additional training. They called it like performance excellence or something like that. Yeah. Whatever that means. <laughs> I think that's a nice. Why are they your mentors? Yeah, like, like I mentioned before, there, uh, Kevin, Malcolm, Craig, Richard, and Darren, all fantastic mentors to me. Um, at, at Wells Cathedral, I remember uh, Matt, Matt Hobbs. He was a, he's a little uh, deaf guy actually, and. He's just a killer, killer, killer stonemason. Fantastic stonemason. He taught me a lot of little tips and tricks. That stuff totally outside the box and never would have thought of, which I still use today. Um, another chap called Martin Smith. He was uh, another big mentor of mine. He taught me a lot. Um, a chap called Mark Pate, who I ended up working for uh, in 2016, actually. He was, he was like a, a main mentor for me at Wells, too. But really, yeah, it was a bit of everyone. Little bits here and there, you know. We'll try this, try that. You know, it's cool. Yeah, that's another testimony to the camaraderie of it. Everyone's taking you everywhere, so that's a that's fantastic. Yeah, and like every day is uh, every day is a school day for me. Like 
I know, I'm always learning stuff. Like you never stop learning. Never ever. It's great. Even though I work with a lot majority of people younger than me or around the same age, you're still learning stuff. You still get tips here and there, different sites, different places. That's one of the great things about my job too is being able to travel and seeing how different things are in different places and different sites, different techniques. It's great. Um, the willingness to persevere when you kind of blow a corner off could be the most aggravating thing when you're first starting out, you know, especially when they told you already, you know, don't do that or do this and you end up doing it anyway. Um, yeah, perseverance and willingness to just, just to continue and carry on. Because like I was saying before, like, you, you could be working a stone for, you know, especially when you start out and you're slow, you know, basic flat surface is going to take you a couple of days. You get to the end and you blow a corner off, like, well, oh, it's tough. Like, it's, you know, you got to just move on with it. You got to get on with it. So, yeah, definitely perseverance, I would say. Yeah, it's absolutely heartbreaking moment, I'm sure. I've seen some bad ones too, like even accomplished guys. Uh, Martin Smith earlier, I was telling you about, he, uh, he was rubbing a fireplace uh, lintel and it probably took him a couple of days and beautiful, like, collection fireplace lintel. And he's rubbing it on his banker on his, his table and it just falls in half, just splits in half. And he, yeah, obviously absolutely lost it. He's like throwing his mallet to the window. Like, it's crazy, like, crazy, crazy stuff. But there was a, a natural defect in the stone. The stone's obviously a natural product. You get natural defects too, much like with wood. And uh, yeah, it was, it's, a, it's a vent, which is basically like an air pocket inside the stone and it created a weak spot and he just he, he somehow worked the entire stone without it falling apart until right at the end so it happens moments like that test your uh, test your patience perseverance yeah. willingness all. stone uh comes in all different shapes and sizes and textures and bedding and uh, a good understanding of that is, is vital if you want to really carry on down down the path of a stonemason. But you're, you're taught all this stuff right at the beginning, um, in particular uh, bedding planes, so like how the stone is formed. Um, when you cut the stone, it's it's incredibly important to know this because you could make your life a lot easier by working the stone with the bed, say, because it's going to split. If you're chiseling it this way, it's going to split this way too. Um, and again, when it's installed in the building, it needs to be the correct bedding. So to give an example, uh, a keystone, which is uh, if you have an arch, the keystone, which is the center part of the arch there, it has to be edge bedded this way because the pressure is coming in this way. If it was naturally bedded, which is this way, it's just gonna drop out. So that pressure is gonna, it's not gonna do anything, it's gonna drop out. So little things like that are really important to know. Um, going back to the hand tools too, is why it's so crucial to have those skills is that you, you just learn to get a feel for how the stone breaks and how the angles you need and the chisel control is just this is a honed skill it takes years and years to, to get right so yeah but in terms of material yeah it's a uh, stone it's working with lime mortars in the sand aggregate um, i don't touch much of that stuff um, but it's important knowledge to know too uh, what else? Yeah, glue, you know, epoxy resin, um, a lot of pinning is uh, we use epoxy resin uh, and repairs too. We use a lot of epoxy resin. It's just a two part mix. Um, so that's about all I can think of right now. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, again, it's uh, simple on the surface. And then we even talk about just the, the different, the different ways the, that you have to, you have to place them and it, it's uh, such a detailed and intricate, intricate trade that uh, I think I can, also, expand, I can expand on stuff too. That would know. actually be, uh, I was actually going to ask about different types of stone. If there was a particular type that you look for, different types of, um, I was going to ask for, if you're coming from the UK, I'm sure it's different, different stone there than it would be using in Canada and especially in Alberta compared to PEI, if you want to touch on that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Geography based or anything like that. Yeah, we'll keep it Canada, keep it relevant. Um, so yeah, primarily 
uh, stones that are used in, in Canada is Berea sandstone uh, and also Indiana limestone. So difference being one's a sandstone, which is kind of coarse and sandy really, and often heavily bedded. What I was talking about that earlier, you can see the bedding planes in sandstone a lot of the time, which makes it easy to identify. Whereas a lot of limestones are uh, not completely free bedded, which means they don't really have a bedding plane, but it's kind of hard to distinguish with, with limestones. Um, Indiana limestone is the other largely used one here in Canada and also in the States. And uh, oh, so Berea is from Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, and Indiana is from Indiana. Good to tell you the exact location, but. Um, my personal favorite is, is limestone. I'm a limestone guy. I use that almost exclusively during my apprenticeship growing up. Uh, cuts nicer, nowhere near as bad for you. Um, just leaves a wonderful edge. Uh, big, big limestone fan. And sandstone, depending on where, where you get it from, uh, softer sandstones definitely wear out quicker, a lot quicker. The apartment buildings are made almost entirely out of Berea sandstone. Uh, out here, they're using uh, Wallace sandstone, which is really hard, very, very, very hard. So all the stones come in all different um, hardnesses, I suppose. Uh, granite being the hardest. And you can get some soft limestones that you can work just with like a rasp. You know, you, you almost feel that way with your fingers, it's so soft. There's a wide, wide variety, and that just comes with experience knowing how to work those stones and what they can withstand and again going back to the chisel angles how to work them yeah i was going to even say i remember growing up in calgary the the, the old city hall um made out of sandstone and just going on as a kid and rubbing your hand on it and you keep making yeah. the reflex on it yeah. just from there too so and that's why I'm, i didn't expect sandstone to be such an intricate part of stone of stone working and um what what would be the difference between why would you use limestone uh, instead of sandstone? And when, what are situations that you'd use sandstone over limestone? Or does it really is just up to whoever, whatever they want, kind of thing? Well, it depends on the project you're working on, whether it's a private or a public project. And with heritage restoration, we try to use the best match possible. That's in terms of how it's going to weather over time, um, compression against mortar, color match, obviously, is a big one. Uh, Project. They ended up sourcing stone from Germany and Spain, uh, as well as the, the Berea stone there, just to try and find the best color match. So the color is probably the, the first priority, and then the other things come second to that. But uh, yeah, with Heritage, they try to match as is, if possible, if not closest match. So uh, Pascapu is what the original building is made out of, but those quarries are now closed. So uh, Berea was the kind of second best match and then Warthauer was for the German one and Castillo was a Spanish one I believe. For that one. And now you're saying so you use Indiana limestone and uh, sorry what is Ber Berean sandstone what was it? Berea. Berea. Yeah uh, people just call it Ohio. Ohio yeah sandstone. I was gonna say I'll, I'll call it Cleveland sandstone. So Cleveland yeah <laughs> Cleveland works yeah yeah. Um, now now if you just quickly answer what what we use in UK would it be limestone there as well? Oh, UK, uh, so yeah, UK primarily is uh, Bath stone, which is right from where I'm pretty much from. It's about an hour from where I'm from. Uh, Roman, you may have heard of the Roman baths, maybe? Yeah, as, as a yeah, history but, major, I, I, I'm familiar with, with baths. Yeah, yeah, I figured. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, beautiful, beautiful city, actually. Yeah, like golden, soft uh, limestone. That's a dream to work. Like, it's, uh, yeah, it's night and day when you compare it to like the Wallace sandstone here. The Wallace sandstone here is like bullet hard. Um, to put these tooling marks in, I'm like, I'm wailing on it each time. Whereas the bath stone, we used to work with uh, a French drag, which is a piece of wood with sharpened metal teeth in it. And you could just kind of peel the stone away with this drag, uh, which made life very easy. So it was actually an adjustment for me coming to Canada and working a lot of sandstone where you can't use tools like that it's it's got to be chiseled uh, it's worth mentioning actually uh, with a lot of softer limestones you can use rasps and and these drags of all various shapes and sizes uh but when it comes to sandstone 
you have to use chisels. And also hard limestone, you have to use chisels. So, um, yeah, so Bath was uh, the first one. And then Portland limestone is the other main architectural stone in the UK. So if you take a walk around London and you look up, like 90% of the buildings are made out of Portland. A lot of stuff in the UK is made out of Portland. As you travel further north, it's more sandstone territory. But yeah, the south of the country is Bath and Portland. I, I also have a question. My last question about the about the types of yeah, stone re reasons for using the types of stone would be, I think in UK PEI um, or uh, in rain, a uh, lot of moisture in the air, and you're you're by the sea. Uh, but then compared to Calgary, higher altitude mountains, you know, still still damp, still wet, but uh, you know, less less salt in the air. Considerably you know, drier. Considerably yeah, drier for sure. Yeah. Um, would there be a difference in using stones based on on that geographical factors? Uh, weather dependency, yeah, yeah. Like I wouldn't wouldn't recommend some softer limestones in a in a Canadian climate. You know, it just wouldn't wouldn't withstand. You know, it's 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 amazing looking at some of the softer sandstones on the buildings that are around and seeing what good condition they're in. Really, like the freeze thaw cycle does destroy buildings here in Canada pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, the fact that Calgary doesn't use much salt, um, whether you're happy about that or not, but uh, it's, it, it's a benefit, really, to a lot of the buildings there. Like, if you can compare to some of the buildings out in Ontario, you can see their damage is really bad, really, really bad. Like, out here, the, uh, like, they love using the salt on the roads. So you can tell, like, yeah, ground level, you know, like, serious, serious damage in comparison to Calgary. That's interesting, yeah. Basic kit is comprised of a nylon mallet, which is a kind of funny white mallet you may have seen. It's like a plasticky type material. It's round because it's designed so that you can hit it at any point on the mallet and you're gonna get an even strike. So it doesn't matter where you hit it, you don't really have to focus too hard, you know, you're always gonna get that even strike. That's that's why the shape is what it is. And it's that, that one mallet is, tends to last you probably your whole career, which is kind of cool. And you, you see other Mason's mallets and you kind of see how much work they've done, you know. They, they tend to apple core after a while and that's like a sign of masonry badassery is if you got an apple core mallet, like it's pretty cool. Um, in terms of chisels, you get uh, various sizes of just flat chisels and you get a style called bullnose. Bullnose is a curved chisel. And that's used to carve uh, architectural elements that have kind of curves in them. So um, a, a cavetto, which is basically a quarter circle. Uh, this way, you get the ball nose in there and you, you'd run lines along the cavetto. So the straight chisel would dig in with those lines, but the ball nose hits the curve nicely. And you can get pretty extreme. You know, you can have like two millimeter increments of each chisel if you really wanted. Uh, basic set comprises of, uh, a, of so one of each of these ball nose and a flat one is be a two inch, uh, inch and a half, an inch, uh, uh, three quarter inch, and a half inch would be like a basic set, and you'd have like I said each of those for a ball nose and a flat one, and that covers pretty much all of your bases. Uh, carpenter square, sinking square, uh, lots of straight edges. Just like a, just a flat metal bar kind of thing. Um, you get to use dividers and calipers and things like that. But traditionally, the banker mason wouldn't do much setting out or geometry. That's the draftsman's job. And the draftsman, which could be actually another dying trade, um, in terms of masonry anyway, I don't know about carpentry, but um, the draftsman would do your, your, your detail for you and they would supply you with plastic templates or metal templates or wooden templates back in the day and then you just apply the templates onto the stone and you would banker or work the stone so not too much like kind of geometry kit but i have calipers and, and all that good stuff too in terms of the chisels themselves uh they're tungsten tip chisels so you still there, Quinn? Heard about the tungsten tip stuff? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so tungsten tip chisels, 
Uh, you can get fire sharp chisels too, which are just, just sharpened metal, but they're practically useless on anything that's remotely hard. It's just for soft stone only. And some people use actually carpenters gouges on really soft stone. Um, like typically bass stone, you, you'd use that kind of stuff. Yeah, tungsten tip chisel, uh, to keep those things sharp. Um, again, learning to, learning to sharpen them, it's a skill too that you, you're taught early on. Important to get a nice straight edge on either side and you can modify either edge to have a different angle depending on how you want to cut the stone. Yeah, um, also you use a, a mash hammer, so like a three pound or a four pound mash hammer and you'd use that in conjunction with a, a pitching chisel which is used for removing large amounts of material and waste. So before grinders and all that good stuff, traditional masons would, would pitch like huge, huge, huge masses of material using their pitch and mash hammer. And then they punch it afterwards, which is another chisel you use with your mash hammer. And a punch is a very narrow tipped, kind of beefy at the, at the shank, but narrow at the point. You use that for wasting a lot of material off. So the process goes pitch, punch, and then you use a claw chisel. And much like the regular tungsten chisels, the ball nose and the flat ones, you can also get claw chisels that are ball nosed and flat. Although it seems pretty rare today to see many masons using claw chisels because it's all grinders and and you use a pneumatic gun with a regular flat chisel, you basically get the same effect. It's more of a, a traditional tool to claw. You do get clawed finishes on certain stones though. So you see them playing. Like I have a couple, but I've never really used them. So you, sorry, I digress. Uh, so you pitch the stone off and you punch off the, most of the material. And then the idea of the claw is that you get it as close to the finish line as you can. So you're leaving like two mil, one or two mil maybe, and then you take that off with your flat two inch chisel right at the end. So it's just like shaving off that last bit. Uh, in your apprenticeship, you're taught to work like to the bone with your claw chisel. Like you'll put a straight edge on it and it's gotta be like completely flat to a mil, which is hard, like <laughs> very hard to do. Uh, but yeah, you get proficient at it. You do it so many times and it becomes second nature and you don't think about it like, like a lot of the trades. That's fantastic. That's a, some excellent detail and uh, very insightful on the, especially the hand tools and just the intricate work that's needed to be, uh, needed to be done for the, the, this, uh, this work here. And, the, and okay, I just keep going power. back to, I've, Sorry, uh, you cut out there, or maybe I cut out there just on that last, last thing you said there. What was that? Oh, I could expand on the power tools too, if you'd like. Yeah, sure. That's, yeah. Let's hear it. It's an, it's an important part of the trade nowadays too. Absolutely. I was going to ask, what do you use more, power tools or hand tools? I like it all over it. Uh, there are some days where I don't pick up a chisel. There are a lot of days where I don't pick up a chisel. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, no, if you want to expand on the power tools as well, that'd be awesome. Yeah, you know, yeah, grinders are a blessing and a curse, and they're, they're great. I, I personally love them, and they're great. Um, that's also a skill, you know, it's totally a skill that needs to be refined and honed, and yeah, it takes a long time to get right. Um, moving on from hand tools, we, we move on to pneumatic air guns. A popular brand is uh, F&K, which is a German brand. They're quite distinguishable, they're green and black colorways and they do you know thousands of different sizes of these things but it's much like a mechanics kind of air hammer or it vibrates very quickly i can tell the exact specifications but yeah you're basically again you're shaving you're shaving stone off with a with a, with a pistol gun or there's more heavy duty ones which is called a swan neck which is kind of has this kind of swan neck shape to it more beefy so whereas traditionally a mason would be punching a lot of that waste material off with his mash hammer, nowadays, if, if you couldn't use a grinder, which would be a go-to, you'd use a swan neck and a, and a, and a point chisel and you'd, you'd rough off that with, with a swan neck. So you see a lot of that. Basically like a mason's bulldog. You ever use a Bosch bulldog hammer before? Like that kind of thing. A mini, a mini jack hammer, pretty much. Um, and then, yeah, grinders. So grinders, uh, 
use typically a five inch grinder and a nine inch grinder, nine inch grinder for wasting off lots of material. And when I started my apprenticeship, uh, there was only kind of carbon blades. So masons would, would cut in the depth of the blade and that was it, that's as far as you can go. So say give or take like four inches or so, and then you pitch that off and then you get to work with your chisels afterwards or you'd use a spinning cup on a smaller grinder. But a couple of years into my apprenticeship, they uh, discovered flush cut blades or flush mounted, excuse me, flush mounted blades. So the flush mounted blade doesn't have an arbor on one side. It has an arbor on, on only on the attachment side. So what this means is you can cut in, knock the stone off and you can cut in again. And you knock that stone off and you can just basically cut to infinity, which made production way, way, way quicker. Did you cut, you cut any angle like this, you know, um, a chamfer, which is like a typical molding, which is basically a 45 degree. You could cut chamfers off in you know zero time. You just cut right to the line, knock it off, cut it, knock it off, cut it. So it really, really improved efficiency, and uh, yeah, it's it just can be a lot more enjoyable too than working by hand sometimes, just because of that efficiency aspect. Uh, the downsides of that are see insane amounts of dust, um, which is a or the constant problem with kind of fighting on site. I feel like. General contractors should probably understand that we make a lot of dust by now, but you may be surprised <laughs> uh, that they don't. And uh, the sandstone dust is killer. It is a killer. Um, silicosis is a big problem. Um, thankfully, nowadays, you know, we're a lot stricter on that stuff. There's a lot more awareness about it. But when I started the trade, yeah, there wasn't any guys wearing masks. So uh, me included, like we worked limestone primarily, thankfully, you know, which has detrimental effects somewhat, but nothing, nothing in comparison to, to, to silica and sandstone. So yeah, it's a double-edged sword with the grinder. It's super efficient, but you know, causes chaos for everyone around it. So, mm -hmm. but that's the way we that's the way we kind of go right now. With using a grinder six plus hours a day, pretty much. So. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a nice little brutally honest answer i can give you i can give you several answers i was just debating this question this is a really good question actually um i've come across many people many different feelings and thoughts and on the spirituality of the trade or whether there even is one at all um again it depends on who you ask and how long they've been doing it for uh, and actually the environment too um i kind of i want to break it down into into three kind of separate characters Categories. That sounds great. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's. I'll start. I'll start with the, to the, the worst one. But um, it's not. You know, worst is a terrible word to use. But com commercial masonry. So it's big, big sites, big buildings, lots of lots of humans. It's it can be a production line type of vibe. Right? It, it can be like I'm, this is like the real truth side of things. Is that that spirituality can be lost very easily, very, very easily, because you just, you just feel like you're part of a process, you know? And uh, I've had these thoughts over the years. I think many Masons have that work in commercial projects um, that you are, you know, you're kind of part of a production line and it's like, get this done. And like some days you make 25 window sills, you know? I mean, sometimes it can be hard to find the spirituality in that, right? But that being said, it's not all, it's not all, being gone and forgotten. Um, there's, there's two other facets that I want to cover. And one of them is the craftsman mentality. So much like you touched on the guy with, with his wood shavings and his, his zen, he's in the zone, you know. The stones that I make, and uh, whilst I'm making them, it can be very easy to get lost in them, completely lost in them. And all I'm focusing on is the stone and the angles and what I'm cutting. And, oh, this needs a mill here, or this, mean, this needs two mill here, you know. Um, but the main thing for me is that uh, I love historic buildings and we need to keep them alive. And it's like I mentioned earlier, the cool thing is that every stone I make or repair I make, it's going to be there for a long time, a very long time, you know, hopefully a hundred years. You know. A good example would be Cabaret Historic City Hall. Got to work 
two of the, the coolest pieces I've ever worked in my whole career. On, on the north side, there's two huge sculptural pieces, they kind of like flowers above the sea train station. And every time I walk down there, I'm like, I made that and that's gonna be there for a hundred years. And there's something amazing about that. Spiritually, I think there's something amazing about that. You know, it's like a part of me in that building. So yeah, I think it's like, I'm, I'm leaving a part of myself in that building and impacting that building's life, um, increasing its longevity. Um, and that I can, I think that's also shared by not only the craftsman mentality, but the artist mentality too. You know, however, easy it can be to be pulled in by the commercial mentality of the production line we need to be reminded that you know what we do is is a craft and an art too you know in so many ways i think that can be easy to forget and i've certainly forgot over the years about like how special it is what we do so yeah that's why